Hey, everybody. I'm excited for this episode because Elle and I are going to get into some of the science of nutrition and body composition and the stuff that we actually specialize in. I thought we thought, okay, they probably want to know some of the, the juicy stuff that we've picked up in our brains over the course of our careers in regards to fat loss, body composition, longevity, health. And so we're going to talk about what we really know a lot about, and that is the paleo primal ancestral lifestyle and also the ketogenic diet, which is what I specialize in. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask Elle to start off by just because you guys probably know that Elle hosts the Primal Blueprint podcast. So she has interviewed countless experts, coaches, people who have had amazing transformations from this lifestyle over and over and over. So Elle, in doing that, what are the principles of truth that you have just found that, okay, this is what everybody is saying over and over and over and what I'm hearing. So what, what has really stuck out to you as a common pattern for success in nutrition? Yeah, well, I guess I would say that I initially had, I was a food addict and completely a sugar addict for years, and it didn't matter what my body looked like. So even at my fittest or my rippest or whatever, I was mm -hmm. struggling inside all the freaking time. I was addicted. I even thought about going to Overeaters Anonymous meetings because I was like, what's wrong with me? And wow. I thought, Tara, I'm like, I, I'd look at like super fit people like you and I'd be like, are they suffering? Are they just hiding mm -hmm. it? Like, are they not mm -hmm. telling the truth either? Or, or am I screwed? Because, right. because so many we, people can relate to that. It, it listen, it doesn't matter like how much you weigh if you're thinking about food all the time. And it's like eating disorder making because you mm -hmm. bargain with yourself. I mean, I'd even be like, all right, well, if I drive around the parking lot at the store and there's a space, then I can get the donut. I mean, I mean, like it's just, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. awful. I'd eat one mm -hmm. meal and I'd be thinking and calculating what could I get away with later. Yeah, um, I remember that. I, I just, I, you know what? Honestly, I suffered with this for like most of my, you know since teenage mm -hmm. years and so i mm -hmm. thought i was screwed and i would always be envious of people who are like i oh, just have their three meals a day <laughs> like i just i right. did not understand it i was like never satisfied <sighs> i didn't realize that i was eating against what my dna as a human being expects of me okay mm -hmm. and so it wasn't until i got into the paleo primal and so i want to clear up some things for people so people are always like what's the difference between paleo primal ancestral evolutionary mm -hmm. they are really all the same umbrella that's what everyone mm -hmm. has to understand it's all really ancestral health which is really mimicking and trying to model what our ancestors before the agricultural revolution and 10,000 years ago because we've been evolving for 2.5 what they were doing because they didn't have modern diseases. So for example, rheumatoid arthritis never came on the scene. Uh, paleontologists has never seen it in the archaeological record until 10,000 years ago when grains came on the scene and started to, you know, we know that grains are a trigger for autoimmune disorders, which we can always do another, you know, episode at some point when we do a health, we do our mm -hmm. health episodes, we can go into that deeper. But here's the most important thing to understand, I think, for people. There's either, there's two camps you're in. You are either a sugar burner or you are a fat burner. And so what is a sugar burner you would ask yourself that these are the symptoms of what it means to be glucose dependent or a sugar burner and this is really the, the the paradigm that can get you on that eat three meals a day and two snacks eat every two three hours that is what we've learned not the way to go and we can talk about why because of insulin later but just as a general so for example if you are out there right now and you cannot go four, seven, eight, 24 hours without eating food, or you will have a hangry, cranky meltdown and be a disaster. You're a yep. sugar burner because I just woke up this morning. It's already 11 a.m. I've had a cup of coffee. I could not eat for three days and I won't suffer because my body has been adapted and primed to use fat as the primary fuel. So what's going to fuel me, let's say if I got stranded on an island today, is the fat off my thighs, right? You know, and all mm -hmm, that stuff. And mm -hmm. we can get into ketones and stuff later. Mm -hmm. So sugar burner, like you're always thinking about food. You can't go two, four, five, six, eight, 24 hours without it. Um, you're constantly thinking about food. You can't seem to lose weight. And so then paleo primal ancestral in general is a high fat, moderate protein, low carb paradigm. And we'll get into when we talk about keto that when the carb goes further down, it's keto. So there's really no difference between keto and paleo other than are you going to be paleo keto? Right. Mm -hmm. Or are you going to, mm -hmm. but it's the same food groups, which is like the clean right. ancestral food yep. groups. And then yep. fat burner is this, like if you're a fat burner, you can go long periods of time without food. You don't get hangry and crinkly and you very, you rarely think about food. You're completely satiated. The nicer thing about that too, is that life and exercising is way better. So what people mm -hmm. don't understand is they'll look at a paleo primal food list and they'll go, I did paleo and it didn't work for me. And it's like, yeah, but were you still running at set over 75% of your max heart rate, like all week and doing all these things? things because again those are glycolytic activities mm -hmm. and that's why in the primal blueprint and the kind of like primal laws we always say look 
maybe twice a week, depending. If you're a CrossFit athlete, okay, the things are out the window a little bit. But if you're a normal person in this world, you're working out and you want to be healthy, um, you're, you're going to come across trouble because you can eat this diet, but then if you are continually in glycolytic workouts, you're depleting the right. glucose, you're going to need to refill it. So we always say like slow, steady pace. So you really take like the Phil Maffetone um, chart or, or, or calculation, which is 180 minus your age, whatever that number is in in heart rate, you don't really want to go over that too much, maybe a couple times a week, but it shouldn't mm-hmm. be every day because then again, mm-hmm. then you're in this glycolytic cycle. So people just think it's a diet list. It's not. It's about movement and lifestyle. And of course, proper sleep, etc. Um, right. There are some other rules that go out the window. So if you are a sugar burner, yeah, you are going to have to go bust your ass on that elliptical at a pace that's going to burn the glucose. And this is why people don't get anywhere at the gym and they're working out all the Mm -hmm. time and they never make improvements. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And so, you know, they're burning the glucose, they got to refuel the glucose. So one of the hardest things for me when I first went paleo primal is having to look at my heart rate monitor watch while I was hiking. And I was going, I had to go slow to maintain Mm -hmm. that like maffetone scale. And the thing is, is that it felt wrong at first because we're primed for suffer, sacrifice, no pain, no gain. The harder I work, the harder I sweat, the more I'll burn fat. But what I'm doing when I'm hiking at a high pace is I'm really just burning my glucose stores. And we can only store mm-hmm. like, I don't know, maybe 200 grams or whatever it is in all of the organs. Mm-hmm. So again, to preserve that, and that's why you're hungry and sore and tired after a workout. And you're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to go eat. When you work at this other pace, this fat burning pace, which feels wrong at first because it seems counterintuitive, mm-hmm. you're not hungry afterwards. You're not sore because you didn't deplete any glucose stores you burn the fat off of your body at that moment and the other rule that doesn't apply is this so if you're a sugar burner yeah you're gonna have to go do all this stuff so it's a it's a it's a crappier life because you have to work out more seemingly and that's just going to eventually get you to a place where you're ruining your adrenals but aside from that if you don't follow the rules like eat within an hour after exercise and all that stuff as a sugar burner your muscles are going to start to catabolize. They're, those rules are kind of out the window when you're keto, paleo, primal. You can or cannot eat within an hour, and it's not going to screw up and catabolize your muscles. And I remember many years ago, talking like maybe 15, 20, 20 years ago, I had a friend who did the zone diet and had it delivered, and they measured everything. He's kind of an ath- like regular athlete like us. And I didn't know anything about paleo primal then. But when I learned about it, I remember distinctly this moment where we were sitting in his apartment and he's like, I think I have to call the zone people because like, I don't know if I need more nutrients or what it is, but I feel like my muscles are eating themselves. And I, and, and I called him and I'm like, dude, you remember when you said that they were, (laughs) they Mm -hmm. were, they were eating themselves. So again, it's actually more pain, suffer, and sacrifice to be a sugar burner in every way. And it only will really lead to sugar issues and, you know, insulin issues and, 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 and resistance. So again, our DNA as humans, you don't feed a steak to a horse because it has its own DNA that prescribes of it what it functions well off of. Same with a cow. They've got four stomachs. You and I can't process that level of cellulose because that's not what our DNA prescribed for us. So can you be a vegan or vegetarian and be primal? It's a little tougher. It's a little tougher. Mm-hmm. You you could do mm-hmm. it, but you're going to make sure you have to be careful, right? So mm-hmm. that's really the difference is the the modern diets of our time in the past and the, the the 1980s low fat craze really blew it for everybody because they're like oh low fat, but it was such a high carb situation. Um, so fat is obviously not the enemy, um, but at the end of the day, if here's the thing: so if you're eating high fat and you're not low carb, you're going to gain weight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because again, the body is going to kind of go for glucose first to deal with that because that's more of a threat. And so here's the thing that, so what you find when you, it takes about 21 to 30 days to really kind of switch over your body from being dependent and addicted Mm -hmm. to glucose as its primary fuel versus Mm -hmm. switching it over to being a fat burner and having fat as your primary fuel. And so Mm -hmm. in order to do that, that is a high fat, moderate protein, low carb paradigm and involves cleaning out your pantry, right? We, We get rid of canola oils, paleo primal is, Grain-free, legume-free, dairy-free, with exceptions. Some people can deal with a high-fat, heavy cream or something like that. If cheese works for you, that's great. I would still say occasional because it can be inflammatory. And then again, like it's not to say that you can never have beans or gluten or whatever, but we know these are offensive foods and they're not necessary. So again, um, I treat them more like treats or something than I would 
in my regular life. And mm-hmm. um, gluten particularly is offensive for uh, autoimmune disorders, periods, and, and sometimes lectins in, in legumes as well. So if you have an autoimmune disorder, you really need to look into something called the autoimmune protocol or a paleo autoimmune protocol. Mm-hmm. Because people with autoimmune disorders have issues with nightshades or things high in histamines like cinnamon even. And so mm-hmm. that's important. If you're out there with an autoimmune disorder, you know, go check that out. So this is really the difference. Most people in our society are sugar burners. They are dependent on glucose as their primary fuel. But what happens when they run out of that? It's only going to like, that's why people are hungry every four hours. And mm-hmm. so here's what happens. Mm-hmm. If you're on the sugar burning train, you ate. Now you have a drop. You're on that plane and it's hour four into that five hour plane ride. And you're like, oh my God. And then you eat the Pringles and you feel better. Therefore, you've got the like, oh, I need to eat every... No, Mm -hmm. you don't. Heroin also will pick you up if you're a heroin addict and you're dropping out. doesn't mean it's healthy. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'm on a plane for 5, 10 hours. Like, I have no issue because I'm fat adapted. So anyone can also go to MarksDailyApple.com, Mark Sisson, Primal Blueprint. Um, My boss, also the founder of the Primal Blueprint podcast, he's written so many books on this. But you can find out all this free information by going to Mark's Daily Apple and typing in fat adapted or sugar burner or, you know, how to read a lipid panel. Oh, something's happening here. I don't know my screen oh my screen just went blue for a second but anyway so uh <laughs> so mark stanley apple has tons of free articles on getting into more about what i'm talking about but that is why we have type 2 diabetes problem that is why because it is a high carb diet mm-hmm. the standard american diet most americans are eating over 300 200 to 300 grams of, to- of total carbohydrates mm-hmm. a day that is just mm-hmm. an insulin resistant diabetes making diet no matter yep. which way you freaking look at it so yep. unless you're a bricklayer or you are an nba athlete and i don't mean like you're a weekend warrior and you work out two hours a day that's not still an athlete level of performance <laughs> it has to be really really severe for you to male or female eat over 150 grams of total mm-hmm. carbohydrates and that's where mark kind of came up with this carbohydrate curve like okay you know, somewhere between 50 and 150 might be good for most people. But also, I'm five feet, two inches tall. I'm tiny. I'm not going to be able to eat probably as many carbs and calories right. as Gabrielle Reese, who's 6'3 and 175 right. pounds. Like, you know, of course. So for someone like me or for, for women that are smaller size, you could look start to look at what your daily carb consumption is and just start there. Because mm-hmm. one bunch of asparagus cooked is 20 carbs in a day of 80 Do you want to drink that green juice that's going to blow you out and be 50 grams Mm -hmm. of carbs and you have no idea? You have to Mm -hmm. start looking at this stuff. One little pint of raspberries might be 14 grams of carbs. So that's where you start. Just look there. And, you know, we don't even have to get into like detailed macros at this point. Start there. It's okay if you overeat at first, a little bit more protein or a little bit more fat. The goal is to really get the brain and your body unaddicted to glucose and turn on the fat burning switches of our genes that are designed to burn fat primarily. And frankly, so I was doing a workout the other day at home and the guy, and I, I was like, oh, because the guy in the video, like, we're like, it's an hour long hit workout. It was like a pretty intense thing. And towards like 40 minutes, he's like, you know, right now your glucose is probably dropping and I don't want your form to drop. And I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? Because he's talking to people that are sugar burners because he's still a sugar burner. He's still on the old paradigm, like the old runners where it's like mm-hmm. carb up before a race and eat a bunch <laughs> of pasta. And right. what they've learned is that all these athletes are becoming insulin resistant and they're going, I don't understand. I have the perfect body. I eat well every day. I just eat a little sugar. Well, it's because they've got like 130 grams of carbohydrates in their shake before they even go out for the run. So here's here's the really the paradigm too. Every time you eat a carbohydrate, you're knocking on the door of the pancreas to release insulin. You keep knocking on that fucker and it is going to get pissed. And there's where mm-hmm. the insulin resist. And I was pre-diabetic, so I can speak to how this feels and it sucks. But that's why we look at every commercial on television is for blood glucose med- medication. It's mm-hmm. why type 2 diabetes is a problem. And the only way to cure and fix type 2 is this paradigm. Interestingly mm-hmm. enough, no, makes absolute sense. So it's just really important that we we see the difference. And we know this because I know you've been around. I'm fat adapted, so I'll be around people and I'll see them like having to go for the food every four hours. And you're like, so here's the other thing that happens. You're on the sugar burning train. You eat, goes down. Then you four hours goes by. Now you've got to drop. You need to lift. All of these ups and downs with blood glucose, your adrenal glands do not like that. And it will shoot out cortisol to respond to that. So now you're getting fatter on the middle. 
it's a stress hormone that doesn't need to be sent and it's a non-cool way versus like a sprint session where those are good flood of stress hormones. And so again, this is, um, and I'm hoping I'm really making sense on this, but it's really the difference between most people are sugar burners and you have to, paleo primals moving over to be a fat burner, which is ancestry aligned with who we are. Our ancestors Mm -hmm. really, when they were roaming around, had almost zero carbs, probably mostly carnivore and or never more than like 80 grams of carbs. And they were um, fat adapted because if they weren't, they would have never been able to walk to that top of the hill to see what was on the other side without dropping and being exhausted and like, you know, uh, being prey. They didn't have a grocery mm-hmm. store. What do you think kept them alive and roaming all those years? Fat. The fat on their bodies, the fat that they're eating from animals. And again, this is why this is important. Now, on that note, when you first go down this road, I think it's okay to just, while you're getting used to it, it's okay. You might overeat fat. You might overeat protein. And that's true. But in general, you know, you can get fat on a low carb diet if you eat more fat than you're burning. So there is a level. It's high fat diet doesn't mean eat all the freaking fat you want. I learned that the hard way, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, Me you know. Too. Mm-hmm. You know, so it doesn't it doesn't mean that. And it also doesn't feel good when you get into this. You you mm-hmm. see when you eat too much fat and you're like, ugh. Mm-hmm. So that's the key. But here's the one thoroughfare we always hear from everybody, every success story. And whether they lost 100 pounds, whether they cured, cured a skin disease, great. This is the thoroughfare, which is exactly mine. Oh, my God. I'm no longer addicted to food. I don't think yep. about food anymore. This is Freedom. crazy and unbelievable yeah. for me to have ever believed. I thought I was cursed for life. I don't care yeah. about all the stuff that's happened to me. I'm so glad that's gone. It is a mental hell. It doesn't yeah. matter how much you weigh. It's such a hell. In fact, someone in my family who's doing Weight Watchers, God bless them, bless their heart. <laughs> no, mm-hmm. it's worked for them, mm-hmm. but I can tell they're still not satiated. They still have a food addiction, right. okay? Right. And they were like, hey, you know, uh, they they just made a comment about an inside joke about a treat we used to like as kids and they were like hey if you you know if, if you're stress eating don't forget about i'm like i'm not stress eating because i don't have any issues anymore with food mm-hmm. um that is really the biggest gift of this and it Definitely. makes sense it makes sense so i would love to see a reality show like a survivor between fat adapted and sugar burners sugar burners <laughs> Seriously? day two mess forget it done <laughs> ah, won't even know what to do with themselves but then what will happen and, and, and then we'll turn to you what will happen after a couple days of those sugar burners with no food in the desert is they'll be weak and then they'll actually get a boost of energy and they'll get like oh I'm okay. And this is why when people who are sugar burners do like a three-day water fast or whatever, they're like, I never felt better by the third day. Yeah, because now what's happened is your fat-burning genes have kicked in and ketones are starting to be the fuel that your brain... And and so I would like to turn it over from there. But if you could explain what ketones are and then like what that difference... Because so now we're not glucose dependent, right? If you're not on glucose, now what are we on? You know, yeah. what are we on? Yeah, yeah. I'll talk all about keto in a second, but first I got to yeah, say, clarify. can we make that happen? Can we make it? It's like every ketogenic yes. person in the world or primal paleo ancestral person in the world would just love to watch that show because like we've all been through that. We've mm-hmm. all lived through that transition. Anyone who's made this lifestyle choice and I'll, you know, share my personal experience back when I was Mormon, I fasted for 24 hours the first Sunday of every month. It was called fast Sunday. And I used to dread that sucker like nothing else. Like seriously, the week before I would be thinking about it all week, like, Oh, how can I get out of this? I loved it when I was pregnant or nursing. Cause I was like, I don't have to, I don't have to. Yay. And the, and then when I was like, Oh you my You like gosh, keep getting pregnant it. so that you don't have to. Yeah. That's why I have four kids. <laughs> that is the only reason. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but yeah, it was like, what would happen is I would be so miserable that I would try to just sleep the last three or four hours if I could. Like I was literally brain dead, couldn't operate, horrible, almost traumatized when it was over. And now I do 36 hour fast all the time. Like I'm, that's been a minute. And the way I do it is I just eat a little bit later than night before. I go a whole day without eating the morning to bedtime. And it's really good for you spiritually, physically. It teaches you that you don't have to freak out and respond to every little hunger cue. You might have two times during the day that hunger peaks up and you're like, oh, well, nope. I'm not going to eat. And then you just, I go work out the next morning, feel great because my body is efficient at running off ketones. And then I eat afterwards and it's beautiful. And I can do that all the time now. And that's the freedom that I found because when I was first getting into like this bodybuilder style lifestyle, which was my introduction to getting fit, you know, there was this bodybuilder bro at the gym that was like, you should eat every two hours. And I was like, every two hours, I will get stressful. Okay. So fat. he's like, no, 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 just divide your calories up for the day 
to buy, you know, to see how much it would be every two hours and just do that. And I remember it was like something like 180 calories or something was what I was trying to do every two hours. So I was just like making all these lettuce wraps and, you know, just trying to do the best that I could. And I was just, I remember I would just be so hungry. It was like teasing, you know, it was like carrot dangling all day long, just this chronic hunger. Um, and finally I got to a point where I just started intermittent fasting and everything, everything changed for me then. And inter so intermittent fasting is a great way. Like if you're trying to work on insulin sensitivity, intermittent fasting is a great intro. And then as we work our way into, and I did, I started very much at the, the primal paleo approach, lost 40 pounds, got an amazing shape. My running, I shaved half an hour off my marathon time. Um, everything, everything got better. I built a ton of muscle and then I found keto. And as I drifted into keto, what was really cool about keto is that even when I was doing like the primal paleo style lifestyle, I wasn't quite getting enough fat, I don't believe. And so when I switched into keto, my mood and my hormones, like I felt, I felt the calming effect. I felt the brain power. I was like, okay, this is really amazing for me. And, um, for, you know, anybody who has type two diabetes or, um, pre diabetes or Alzheimer's dementia, anything like this that runs in their family. Um, one thing my mom has, got diagnosed with type two diabetes when I was in high school. Um, she now has the beginnings of Alzheimer's and I've watched this pattern, um, in her life. I remember before she got diagnosed with diabetes, I remember when we would be driving home from church because here's this, you know, you drive to church 40 minutes. It's a three hour long church and you're driving home now where she's about at that four hour window, maybe pushing past that since she last ate. And I remember you're not when you're Mormon, you can't shop at the store on Sundays, but she would stop at the vending machines at Walmart on the drive home because that was like, okay, because she was like, look at me, I'm shaking. Like I, and she would just say, I, I have low blood sugar. I like this. I did. Or I have hypoglycemia. You know, there's only one way to fix that. This. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'll tell you, you know, um, I, I'll push into that for anybody who can relate to this. Cause I remember, I do remember her handshaking. And I remember I started to identify with this too, cause I didn't have any knowledge. I was like, Oh yeah, we have low blood sugar in our family. Like we have to eat, 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 and have sugar because we have this thing. No, what you have is the beginnings of insulin resistance. And the only way out to yourself is, without the you only knowing. Way Exactly. The only way out is through. And, um, I had a good friend. This is a great example. A good friend of mine. Um, she's at the, her story is actually on my website. If anybody wants to see it, her, her name is Jenny. She is a Miss Fitness world champion, right? So the bikini competitor, figure competitor, like literally the most amazing physique I have ever seen in my entire life, super fit. And I went on a hike with her and about halfway up this big, huge hike, she's like, oh, my, my sugars are dropping. My sugars are dropping. And she pulls out her backpack and pulls out a pack of Skittles. And I'm sitting there like, what? is hap what <laughs> I'm like, Oh no, no, no. Oh shoot. You know, I'm like, okay, I don't want to be the annoying keto coach person, but you know, after she, she had her Skittles and so we we're kind of, it was a long hike. So we're talking about it. And so finally she started asking me some questions about keto. And I, and I told her, I was like, I haven't, I haven't coached somebody who specifically has hypoglycemia or relates with that. And it had been a lifelong issue with her. Like when she was a little girl playing sports, her mom would always bring candy to the games and all that stuff. And I was like, but it only makes sense to me that if you could teach your body how to get past that freak out moment and tap into your fat stores for fuel, then that could go away for you. You know, it sounds like your body's having a really hard time transitioning into fat burning. And so she did it. She did it. And, um, she fasted for 24 hours to get in, didn't work, stayed super keto for like three or four days. And I was getting concerned. I was kind of like, Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> oh, I'm like, okay. And I was like, I know this is a lot to ask, but make sure you stay on top of your electrolytes and water and all those things, your supplements, you know, we had her on all that like basic nutrient stuff. But I was like, can you just do one more fast? Can, you're so close. And so she did one more 24 hour fast. She got into ketosis and I kid you not, she lived in Ireland at the time. I, I she messaged me probably every day saying, for thank months. you. Oh my God. Thank right. You my life. You changed my life. Thank you so much. I'm like, no, you did it. But it because was, she that. was always thinking about food. She might've had this perfect right. body and everything. And again, it doesn't right. matter because the hell on the inside. Right. Yep. And she's, that's what she says in the video that I have. Um, she says, um, I, I felt like I had been living in a fog my entire life. And when I got in ketosis, it was like a whole part of my brain opened up that I didn't even know existed. Absolutely. 
that's life changing. And that's what all of us can experience when we allow our, ourselves to get out of this chronic sugar burning state. And I will say, I, I want to wrap this up eventually. I'm not, I am not opposed to carbohydrates. I am not a keto zealot. I am not like no one should ever eat carbohydrates. That makes zero sense. They're mm -hmm. growing all over the planet for a reason. They have tons of nutrients and benefits, fiber, phytonutrients, antioxidants, all those things. But here's the thing, like you were saying, the re the reason we have so many problems is because the food industry is relatively new to human beings and we haven't always had access to this much food and this much processed food and this much high carbohydrate food and one of my favorite things to see people go through when they switch to a ketogenic lifestyle is awareness like they're like oh my gosh like this one little thing has like 40 grams of sugar in it, you know, that, that moment of surprise. And my kids, they're well aware, obviously, because of what I do for a living. And I was at a gas station with my 12 year old son recently, and he saw this like pineapple Fanta or something like, you know, some pineapple soda. And he goes, did you know that has like 60 grams of sugar in it? <laughs> 60 grams. Well, and you know what? Here's the thing. Like your body doesn't know the difference between the 38 grams of sugar in a Coca-Cola or the 38 grams of sugar in three slices of freaking sugared mango pineapple or whatever right. from, from right. Whole Foods. So you think that's healthy because it's dried fruit. Carbs are carbs are carbs, no matter which way you look at it. Some are obviously better than others. Yeah, some but are again, faster. Right. Yeah, but people, you know, don't don't understand that it like healthy or not, it's still carbs just because it's mango is actually not a necessarily a better choice than the Fanta or the Coca-Cola. And I That's want right. and maybe you can touch on this more, but I want to explain also to people glucose is a dirty burning fuel. That is why keto is so important in, in a therapeutic medical way for people that have epilepsy, traumatic brain injury. Alzheimer's right. and other things because That's our right. brains prefer mostly running on ketones, not glucose, even though it does need some. Mm -hmm. And so again, like I just wanted to set you off there a bit, but um, yeah, those are just interesting, yeah. interesting things people should know. Yeah, let's talk about that because so the CDC estimates that 88 million Americans have prediabetes and that 80% of them don't even know it. I can't even tell you how many clients I've gotten where I have to say, hey, like that your morning blood sugar is in the pre-diabetic range. Just so you know, it's like well into it. Actually, you're high in the pre-diabetic range. No wonder you've been having a hard time losing weight, right? And so to be able to, that's, that's over one in three Americans. This is such a huge problem. Yeah, it's and like, I, I want to say the test too. So if you really want to see, like, am yeah. I insulin resistant? Right. The best one for that, really, it's a three-month glucose tolerance test. It's called the HbA1c, yep. hemoglobin yep. A1c. Right. So no matter what you research out there, because the, the BS system will change the percentages, but right. basically you want a 5.2 or below. Yes. Anything above that, you have increased your chances for cancers and other things by like 200%. So prediabetes mm -hmm. looks like mm -hmm. insulin resistance, prediabetes, I had a 5.7. Dr. Mm. Ken Berry, who's helping people, you know, mm -hmm. be low carb, mm -hmm. he had like, he was at like six. That's mm. kind of type two. You have now entered right. that arena. Most right. Americans don't know where their HbA1c is and you can't trick it like you can other mm -hmm. things by just doing something right for a week. You go right. get that tested in the morning fasting where you're at. Are you at 5.5 or 5.4? Okay, time to take a look at the carbs. Mm -hmm. Time to take mm -hmm. a look at it. If you're above that, you better get your shit to, you better get on the program or you're going to yep. end up inflamed and, and diabetic like I was absolutely going in that direction. 100%. Thank you for for saying that. HbA1c is one of the most important tests that you can do for your overall health. So, um, get that tested. You know, the only way to the only way to know is to test. We can't really know what's going on inside our brain. Yeah, we can have some symptoms, but when you test it's powerful. You can't cheat that number. When you see that number, it's like wake up call. So, definitely I cried get that when I got mine. I bawled my eyes out mm -hmm. when I knew what that was. I lost it. Yeah, it's a reality check, but sometimes that low can propel you into a way better future. Because if you didn't know, you could. it's easy for us to just say, oh, hey, I'm just going to kind of ignore and act like nothing's happening. I kind of don't really want to know. If you're in that, I don't really want to know what's happening inside of me, that's called denial. And your life will just continue to get worse and worse and worse unless you can have that wake-up call, allow yourself to feel the feelings, and then evolve and solve those problems and move on, right? So um, let me talk a little bit about, about ketones in and of themselves and how that process goes. 
glucose. So like Elle was saying, when we, when we um, process glucose, it gives off a free radical. It gives off oxidative stress. I like to just call it rust, right? So it gives off some rust in your body. It has a little bit of, a little bit of inflammation. And that's why if you, if you have done something like low carb keto and you've been there consistently, and then you have some blowout day where you went to, I don't know what, and you had like a bunch of cake and bread and something like that. I have had those moments. Of course I'm a human and I'll wake up and all of a sudden my legs will be sore. And I'm like, Oh, I don't get sore. Like, wait, what? I'm like literally laying in my bed and I can feel achy legs. And I'm like, wow, is that what I would feel like all the time if I ate that crap all the time? And so that's such a, it's, it's kind of a beautiful wake up call of how much your body, how well you can feel, how good you can feel when you just don't put those things into your body and what your whole life, how different your whole life can feel when you do. So when we take away those things, to the point that we now are processing ketones. And what that means is you're taking fatty acids, you're breaking them up in your liver, processing them into ketones, and your body is running off of ketones or fat oxidation. That, that does It burns clean is what we call it, right? And so this is why we get such a reduction in inflammation in our body. Inflammation is the root of every single problem in the body. So if we can put our body in a state where we reduce inflammation drastically, think how much things can get restored to a level of working the way they were always supposed to. So um, when it comes to insulin, insulin, having good blood sugar management is one of the most important things you can do, not only for your body composition, because it will help with that, uh, but it also for your longevity and your quality of life. So the way I like, to, I love analogies. I love visuals. The way I think of insulin is worker bees. And I like to, I like to kind of give them these little cartoon mailman guys. They got their mailman hat and their pouch. And I like, because insulin is a good thing. You know, sometimes we're like, Ugh, I hate insulin. No, insulin is a wonderful, smart, beautiful thing that our body does to deliver energy to every single cell in our body. And also to help us store some for later in the event that we have extra. The problem is we have so much extra. We never allow ourselves to use the extra. But it's important to understand that our bodies are hardwired to want to store body fat. It is a survival mechanism, right? Because if we were wandering in the wild, if we could get a little extra, great. That's why our brains love fat and carbs put together because it's like, that might give me extra. That's a good survival mechanism. That might help me save some for later. But when you have that all the time, you just don't ever tap into that. And then we, t we add on this glucose dependence, like you're talking about, because we eat so often, we've lost that ability to easily transition into those fat stores and use them for full fuel. Now we have a problem, but insulin in and of itself is a wonderful thing. It's just the way I like to think of it as this, like, imagine that you're going through something and your neighbor brings you a cake and you're like, Oh, all right, let, let's say even it's a paleo cake, you know, and, but it's still got sugar. It's got like, it's got coconut sugar or whatever. It's still got sugar. Okay. So they bring you a cake and you're like, that was really nice. And then the next day they come and they bring you two cakes and you're like, oh my gosh, that was really nice. Um, okay. I'll try to eat a little bit of this. And then the next day they bring you three cakes and then they keep bringing you three cakes every day. And now all of a sudden you've got so many cakes in your house. You don't know what to do. The next time the neighbor comes, eventually you're probably going to stop answering the door because you're like, dude, like I got plenty. I don't need any more. Please go away. And so the insulin little worker bee is like, well, I got to put this somewhere. And so it goes and puts it in your fat stores. That's how it works chronically. So it's so important for us. Like I tell, I tell my clients, I'm like, you're hungry. Good. You should feel a little bit hungry every day. At some point during your day, you should allow yourself to, to experience real hunger. Not the very first moment that you felt hungry, you just immediately respond to it, immediately respond, immediately respond. Because when your body sends you that signal of hunger, it's literally like saying, hey, I'm kind of running out of what I got here. And I'm about to use up what you already have. So if you continue to just give it more, it's telling you, it's literally your body's telling you like, Hey, I'm going to start using some of my energy that I have stored up. And you're like, Oh no, no, don't do that. Here's some more. <laughs> right? So it's important for yeah. our long-term insulin management or blood sugar regulation and using up those stores to allow ourselves to sit through a little bit of discomfort of hunger. And it's all good. And it's not because you're fat, even skinny people or whatever need need to be able to do this for proper long-term cellular function and metabolism. Let's talk about skinny fat for a second. So, mm -hmm. uh, so here's the thing, what you just described to you with the, the type two diabetes is like, so you, you hope to God you get fat if you're insulin resistance, because that's your insulin 
and your pancreas trying to save your life by being like, oh my God, get in the fat stores, get in the fat stores, get get mm-hmm. out of her blood, get mm-hmm. out of her blood, like mm-hmm. protect her. It's yeah. like, it's your True. body trying to save you. If that's <laughs> yeah. not happening, it's in your bloodstream, that's even more dangerous. And there are skinny diabetics. So just being fat is not always an indi- right. indication of right. insulin resistance. Totally. Absolutely not. Like your bikini friend, right? She's a total yep. sugar burner. She's fit. She's, you know, what? okay, I get it. Totally. So that's really important too. If you're out there and you're like, well, I'm, I, and, and this is what I say. You think you're getting away with it on the outside, but you are not getting away with it on the back end with the HB1C and continually tapping those worker bees to come out and produce insulin. And the species that live the longest in our world elicit the least insulin output. It's just, Amazing. It's just just true. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge insulin game. But this is where I want to I want to shift the conversation a little bit because yep. I am very very involved in the ketogenic world, right? I go to all the conferences. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of the, like the big influencers and all this and I'm I'm just so in that world. But what I want to say is that once cuz so many people, I mean, I if I had a dollar for, <laughs> for every time I have been asked, "What do I do when I plateau on keto?" Okay. So let's say you still have a lot of weight to lose. Let's say, so I just had a client lose 75 pounds in six months on keto. It was awesome. But he was 360 pounds when he started, right? So he's really happy to finally get under the 300 mark. And he's like, I'm going to get shredded. I mean, he's really doing great. But my clients like this, like I've coached a lot of these bigger guys, you know, that, that have a lot of body fat. And what usually when you are that obese, you have some insulin issues, you have some insulin resistance. And so you do something like keto and this goes for women too. You have a lot of weight to lose. You start fixing your insulin sensitivity, things start going in your favor quite a bit. But then once now it's like, Hey, I have awesome blood sugar management. Like I can eat carbs sometimes and I have total blood sugar, good blood sugar regulation. I can go into keto easily. Like I've this, this issue is pretty resolved for me. I've been working out. I've built some muscle, like I'm feeling good, but now it's like, I still have like 40 or 50 pounds to lose and nothing's working no matter what I do on keto. So this is when I like to give the real talk, the real talk of guess what? Great job. You did an amazing thing for your metabolism. Now you're in the same boat as the rest of us. Now you've got to do things like do a caloric deficit sometimes, um, increase your muscle, help boost naturally your growth hormone by doing high intensity interval training, sometimes paired with a little bit of carbohydrates so that you actually have the glycogen to fuel that kind of performance. Now you get to join the, the, the regular, the regular game. And so this isn't true for everyone. Some people based on their genetics, will do best on extremely low carb borderline keto or keto long term and especially if you have something like a neurological disorder even ADHD Tourette's um, traumatic brain injury even like if your cancer metabolism yep and your brain is impaired like having a fuel source like ketones to your brain all the time is the biggest gift you can ever give yourself so there's some people that yes they should be on keto long term and those people what I would say they know it like they know they feel freaking amazing when they are in a ketogenic state. And when it's any time, no matter how healthy the carbs are, they bring them back. They just like, don't feel as good honor that. And this comes back to a Mark Sisson thing. Actually, I, yeah, I want to get, are you talking about metabolic flexibility before yeah. you get into that? I want you to touch on that, but I wanted to just throw out a thing about cancer and glucose. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So let's, it, let's say you, your body's, you got cancer. Maybe they found one tumor over here and one tumor over there. And the doctor's are like, Oh, well we need to check your whole body to make sure. Right. Okay. The way that they do that is they inject your body with glucose so that the cancer cells will light up and show up. And if that doesn't fucking tell everyone listening yeah, what seriously. you need to fucking know about sugar, what right. freaking does. That is why when people get cancer and they're going through it, being ketogenic can really help starve the cancer cells, but also it helps them through chemotherapy and symptoms and yep. other issues. They don't totally. suffer as greatly. And there are so many stories about this. And again, there's yep. actually, I just, I'll throw out a book right now. There's a book called like the ketogenic kitchen by two women who are double cancer survivors and they Mm -hmm. if if you're someone out there and you know a family member or someone dealing with cancer that's a great book to to look into they they go through recipes they go through their experiences i've also done an interview with them but yeah i said before you get into metabolic flexibility i just wanted to scare the shit out of everybody um (laughs) on on that but it makes sense and also fungus preys on sugar like the overproduction of candida and all that stuff how do you do it you starve your you starve them of the food they want while doing other things like maybe some probiotics and oregano oil and again we could do whole episodes on each one of these things but i think and what you're getting at is what ultimately everybody should achieve unless you are one of those people that has to be strict which is that's right in and out right 
Right. Yes. And so this is my whole premise is keto in and out and do keto, not forever for the normal human. I'm I'm not, I shouldn't say normal, but if you don't have any medical reasons that you're doing keto and amen, my friend Logan Sneed, he has a book called thank you cancer. And he's been, I mean, so many people, especially with brain cancer, if you go to metabolic health summit, um, uh, it's like all the researchers and doctors come and present. There's so much amazing therapeutic benefits of the ketogenic diet. So if you're using it therapeutically, you go, you just stay right there. But for, let's say, you you know, average like Jenny from Illinois, who's 38 and just wants to lose some weight. And so she tried keto, you know, like that's who I'm talking to right now. And I, especially with women, I have found really, really optimal results being able to go through a phase of keto, just like you said, three to four weeks minimum I'd, for most people. Some people need to stay longer, especially if they have high blood sugar, right? Like that's pr- not going to get fixed right. in three to four weeks, even with berberine, like it's, it's not going to, you're going to have to stay a little bit longer. But after that, once it's like, okay, cool, I'm waking up, my blood sugar's like 80, you know, like I can eat carbs and it's all good. Now we switch into, and I, I'm never an advocate of a high carbohydrate diet purely because, and I've experimented with it like crazy, purely because of the oxidative stress. It's just so much, right? It's more yeah. than necessary. And none of us are that active. I'm pretty freaking active. Right. Like, and people, you're not even considered athlete level, even though people would look at your right. IG page and go, holy shit, she's a total athlete. But like, you know, no, my output's not level, ath- you know, prof- right. pro level right now, right? Even, Maybe when you're training, but... But even athletes, I mean, unless they're going for like eight hours a day, a lot of them aren't and they're sitting a lot of the day. Yeah. Unless you're like Michael Phelps or something. So like the reality is we don't move that much. We don't need that many carbohydrates. So yes, I have shifted mostly into a low carb paleo ish style diet. Now, after doing keto strict for a year, I experimented like crazy. I ran the Boston marathon in ketosis. I trained, I did all sorts of training. I had a lot of fun. I have leveled back into like a low carbohydrate diet. And I'm, I mean, I hit it hard. Like people will stop me in the gym and be like, wow, <laughs> like no, you're amazing. you're very inspiring. I'm like, I just freaking love it in here. Like I do. I'm like a, I'm like a dog. I what I call it. I feel like a dog in the gym with this big old goofy smile on my face. Like this is so fun. Like I love pushing my limits. I love being physically active. It is a blast for me. Um, and that is part of the reason I do have some carbohydrates, but I'm rarely over a hundred grams of carbs a day. Right. Even that that's, that is carbs. That is eating carbs to me. Right. And you're talking, so, you talk, we talk, you're talking, you're not doing the game of subtracting fiber. You're talking, and total grams of carbohydrates, right? Yeah. yeah. So we don't play that game. That's an old Atkins game. We don't play that game in the paleo primer world. We just go total carbohydrates. We don't jimmy up the number by subtracting the level of fiber. Just make it simple for people out there. Yeah, I will do that sometimes when I am doing coaching people in keto just because I want them to eat vegetables. (laughs) And otherwise they won't. Right. right. So, but, but as, as, as soon as we shift into a low carb paleo primal, that kind of, it's no, it's just total carbohydrates. And I don't track my stuff every day. I don't believe Cause, cause I don't we know ever. how to eye it now. Yeah. And that's the right. thing too, Once, is you can start tracking it at first just to get used to like how many carbs am I and what is in a thing. Right. But now I kind of know how many carbs is in a large baked potato. It's 54 yeah. grams of carb. Like I kind of know <laughs> that. Right. And yeah. So, you've got your groove thing. Exactly. So you don't need it. And some people look, they like to track their macros. I get it on this note too. I, first of all, I absolutely, you mark myself or all like again you're in and out you know yeah. keto not forever again barring right. the caveat of a, a sit- medical situation um first of all everyone needs everyone needs to go to your website and coach tara garrison on instagram because aside from your workout videos are awesome but you can see what tara looked like before after four children and in general so if you're like i've had four kids it's not possible whatever yeah go check out tara's body because i'm telling yeah. you you really have the best. I've never seen, and I'll say it again. I've said it to you personally. I've said, I talk, I talk about it anytime I bring up your name. I'm like, I've never seen a better body in my life. Like, I just, You're so I nice. really well, can't. You guys, you guys will be like, so oh my nice. God, look at her. So it's, it's really amazing. No, but it's you. not like you've been a personal trainer your whole life and we're always nope. where you don't understand. You do understand on a very oh, yeah. deep level what's it like to be in this prison of sugar, glucose management, and oh, all this yeah. kind of stuff. The other thing I want to say too is the whole key to paleo primal living um, that we sort of try to impart is that once you're over this hump and you've kind of become fat adapted and you're not like you're, you're satiated and you're no longer a sugar addict and a food addict, um, it, the idea is is that you get intuitive about mm-hmm. when you eat. And the rule is if you're not fucking hungry, don't eat. Just nope. don't eat. The only time I do that is if like it's the morning. I know I'm going to get up and go on a long thing. They're probably not going to be food sources. I may right. have a spoonful of fat or a little bit of salmon from the next night or a little something. Usually it's fat. Maybe it's half an avocado. It's got a little bit of carbs. But, you know, I, I do like a fat bomb and then like 
not because I'm hungry, but because I'm like, I know how that day is going to roll out. Like right, it's going to be some right. long, you know, trip on a plane yep. and then I get there. So in that case, I'll hack it that way and I will go against my hunger. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you become intuitive. So it's like, you know, one day I'm just like, man, I need cucumbers too. Like, I don't know. I just, I'm just, right. you start to yep. become intuitive. And this is what's right. great is that there's no rules like, oh my God, it's hour three. I need to eat. Or, oh my God, I'm dropping mentally, right. you know, all this kind of stuff. And I want to go back to something you said before, because I think people could maybe misinterpret it where when you're talking about like now you do easy fast and you might have a moment of feeling hungry, but I know you're going to say this, but your brain's not suffering. Your energy's not no, suffering. Right? Exactly. In those moments, like a fast for a sugar burner, they'd be yes. like having lots of symptoms. That's you're just right. having the like, I'm a little hungry. But the reason it's not a problem is because you're still on fire. You could still go for a workout or run or that's work right. all day long. And that's, that's right. what ketones provides for you. And that's, that's what right. being a fat adapted person allows you to do during a fast. The, and like you so when you said, oh, I had a moment, it's not like a moment of hunger for a sugar burner is not having that moment. They're having like lots right. of things happening. And um, we've been there. Exactly. That's such a great point because it used to be like, I am going to kill someone right now yes. if I don't immediately put something angry. in my body to get you're super hangry and you don't have to live that way. No. no one has to live that way. And you shouldn't. It's wrong. I mean, think about how stupid that is. Why would our ancestors be relegated to a life where they'd have to find food every three, four hours or glucose? They would all been dead. They'd all be right. prey. Saber tooth right. tigers would have gotten their shit. And that would have been the end of it. Right. Because when you get in a ketogenic state, you get more sharp. My brain gets on fire. My eyes, it's like I can see everything. Seriously, I feel like some sort of crazy superhuman. And that makes complete sense. Why would you want to be at your weakest and lowest when you need food? And this is, and why would our metabolism, why would our body have this capacity if we were never meant to use it? right? It has it for a reason. And it is ideal in so many things. Not only, I mean, we haven't even got in into what happens to your nervous system when you go in this ketogenic state, you start, you increase BDNF. So the connections between your neurons is enhanced it and enhance, you actually increase the number of mitochondria and your body. Remember science class, yeah. mitochondria is the powerhouse. You literally increase your power when you so go So type two is mitochondrial state. dysfunction, right? So inability to lose weight or insulin resistance is mitochondrial dysfunction. And those powerhouses right. are kind of dead, not working. And that's what you're talking about. That's right. And when you go into this mimicked fasting state or you do intermittent fasting, you increase your cellular turno- turnover. Like everyone's probably anyone listening to this, maybe you haven't have heard of autophagy. It's basically like you take your old cells that aren't functioning correctly. You strip them for parts, you eat them up, you cannibalize them and you make new healthy cells out of them. That is awesome. That is the fountain the of good youth. shit that's happening in our bodies like mark Sisson says is when we're actually really not eating like you said autophagy and yep. everybody should look that up because it is a clean house operation and you know what here's the thing so you're saying like your eyes are sharper your mind is sharper that's why we have type 2 diabetes your vision goes you know you got stuff yep. amputated um and you know most doctors are gonna just tell you like oh, it's fine we'll just keep looking at your hb1c and no you don't let it get above it. You do your own thing. Mm-hmm. Most doctors don't understand right. nutrition, so they are not going to help you get out of it. They're going to give you a pill and you send you on your way. And only right. the people who have gotten here have cured themselves of type 2 diabetes by doing this. Now, I just want to mention another. So there's a guy named, uh, he's a professor named Timothy Noakes. And he's famous because mm-hmm. he wrote like, I think he wrote The Lore of Running or he wrote one of these books about like carving up and glucose is the fu- fuel. And mm-hmm. he was in the athletic mm-hmm. industry. And then... He got type 2 diabetes years later, and he was like, uh, I was wrong. I'm so sorry. Right. I was so wrong. We were all yeah. wrong. And he had to come out yeah. and like, fall on Good his sword. Him. And you know, yeah. now he, cannot, he has to live a low-carb life because of that. So right. athletes, if you're looking to switch up your shit, just look into Primal Endurance. It's not only a book by yeah. Mark Sisson and Brad Kearns, but they have free podcasts on it that they've done. They did one for like over a year. And, yeah. and there's also a course because – a lot of athletes and bodybuilders are now turning to like, hold on a minute, what we're doing is not good in the long run, right? And so they're switching over to more of a fat paradigm. So they're not having the power gel gel pack during their bike, right. but they may be having a little coconut oil and a little drop of honey or something like that. And again, so if you're an athlete or out salt there, and water, that's, and that's it. Bingo. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so people can look into that if you're like, how do I maintain my athleticism or my training that's something to look into there, like primal endurance and how to, and that could take some time to transition over to that. Mm-hmm. But what's so funny about that is the people I've talked to who are athletes who do that, they're like, I have my life back because I'm not training yeah. 50 hours a day and my wife doesn't hate me because I'm like not home all the time. Because right. it's less effort, more results, 
it's a better life versus the struggle and sacrifice that has to be put in when you are a sugar burning carbohydrate dependent athlete. Mm -hmm. And again, it's going to lead to insulin resistance. It happens. It's happening to all of them. I've spoken to so many athletes, my yoga instructor, the yoga guy for P90X, Ted McDonald, he came on the show years ago and he was like, just got his blood tested because his wife was pregnant. And he thought, ah, just probably time to get his checkup. And he's like, wait, what insulin? What? I'm pre-diabetic. How is this possible? Yep. Yep. Again, yeah, getting away with I it on the outside, like, not on the in outside, inside. Yeah. If you look at, you know, all those before pictures that I post on my Instagram, m almost every single one of those is like a month after I had just run a 26 mile marathon, right? Like a full marathon. And I was on, I was living that life of the carb up, have my peanut butter, honey and banana sandwich before my races and get all the goo packs and eat my little stropal waffles on my long runs and all the carbs. Right. And that's exactly what you described earlier is my body was just dependent on that and that's it. And if I didn't have that, I couldn't perform. And half the time I was eating it totally incorrectly. And so it was actually decreasing my power output. It was just, it was a mess. And then once I adopted this low carbohydrate lifestyle, well, first, the first thing that's going to make you a much faster runner is I drop 40 pounds. I mean, that sure helps quite a bit. And then on top of it, it's just that freedom, the freedom that I experience now that you're describing of not having to eat all the time. It's like this calm. It's like, yeah, I know. Yeah. Technically I feel pretty hungry. All right. It's time. I'll eat some food, but it's not like, what can, I, I mean, I can easily cook up a huge egg, you know, egg scramble and be patient and just cook it and just eat. It's freedom. And it's the yeah, same. And the hunger is not immediate. The hunger is not like, Oh my God, I'm going to freaking murder right. somebody. It's more like right. I'm hungry. All right. I think I can. And you have time versus when right. you're a sugar burner, you have that drop and you're like, I'm about to murder someone. My head's empty. I feel brain empty. My headache. I got you're, you're on edge. You're shaky that is a hypoglycemic carbohydrate dependent kind of hunger. When you're paleo primal and you're fat adapted, the hunger is like, huh, yeah. You know, I mean, again, like you could just calmly cook. It's not like, oh my God, if I don't get to a restaurant now, I'm going to start yelling at everybody. And that's a lot. That's most people. Um, and so, sorry, go ahead. Let me let that, sorry, that reminds me of like, let me hit a little woo woo for a second, a little bit yeah. spiritual, because I have noticed when I go to these, you know, paleo effects or metabolic health summit, or these, these conferences and events where everyone is living this kind of lifestyle, I'm like, these are some healthy freaking people. And I am not talking about what the way they look. Yes, they look healthy and they're glowing and all of that, but it's the way that they think it's a super abundance mindset. I can do anything. They're all into personal development. They're changing their lives. They're leaders. They love people. Like, even though, you know, you might be talking to your biggest quote unquote competitor in the industry and you're like, man, how can I help you? Like, you know, it's very collaborative. These are healthy people. And I'm like, this is what it looks like when our brains work correctly. Yeah. That's a good point. This is what it looks like when our hormones are on point. Like it makes you literally a happier person that also knows that your strength comes from the inside out. Because when we live in this lifestyle where I have to get everything from outside of me, I ha I need this, I need glue, I need food, I need snacks, blah, blah, blah. You get, when you release that, it starts to evolve into your psyche. I really truly, this is what I experience. It's 100%. Like, Everything that I need is coming from the inside out. I have more than enough. I have more than what I need. And it starts to evolve into other areas of your life where you're like, I got this. I don't need things from outside of myself to help me. It's all coming from within. And so it's like this combination of having your brain work correctly and then realizing that you have so much immense power. You have so much steadiness. You have so much stoicism. You have the strength that you need coming from inside you. It affects every area of your life. And I see that in people who live this lifestyle, my clients included everyone. I'm just like, you are such a badass. Like you, yeah, if you want to be confident as fuck, like, you <laughs> yes. know, it's the no, but really, uh, it does. And I, you know, we, and to the honest, we're going to do a lot more of these, you know, probably once a month where we're going to do some health thing. And we'll talk more even about some of these topics. Cause I know we, there's probably some still to go on, but in kind of wrapping up and I, and then I, uh, I want to throw this out there. So you talk about mood, you talk about happiness. Um, uh, Allie Miller, uh, the anti-anxiety diet. A lot of people become, I'm a primal health coach. I was one of, I'm like the fifth person in the world. Now there's thousands, but primal health, uh, uh, there's a lot of primal health coaches that are, um, mental health care workers. Mm -hmm. And when they implement this with their clients, again, so you, you, you study the glucose, you study the cortisol, and you're not having these right. crazy things, not to mention the regulation of all your neurotransmitters and everything else right. when you're fueling your brain. Do you really need the Xanax? You fucking might not. 
You right. might not. So right. again, if you are having anxiety issues or blood sugar issues or hypoglycemic or all this kind of stuff where you mm -hmm. feel like, oh my God, it's hour four, I hope I'm near food, um, then you need to go in this direction. But I, here's the thing, you... <clears throat> You offer meal plans and keto coach. So tell us uh, as well, I mean, <clears throat> wrap up and however you want, but I also like to tell you what you have to offer people as well to help them through this, aside from just watching you on Instagram and seeing some of the things you post, because you do offer a lot to really help people with this. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I do. I mean, I, I will take you through step by step the process. That's what I do is like, you know, there's a lot of functional medicine doctors and doctors and people who are advocating this for their clients, but they need some, a lot of times they need someone to guide them through the process and help yep. them optimize it. So that's what I do. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching that that is the biggest part of my full-time job is co helping people optimize not only keto but low carb lifestyles as well we just see what is needed and that's how we go from there um, I do mental and emotional coaching too as well through my process because that's like the biggest part of it <laughs> a lot of it is unresolved trauma our food issues and totally. our not lack of belief in ourselves and all that and it, a lot of it is comes from childhood and it's cool to pull those things up and like get past them and re-examine them now with our adult intelligence and then I do keto challenges I actually just started one two days ago so every month I do a either a keto 28 day keto challenge or a 28 day low carb challenge. We alternate. So, um, may will be our low carb challenge and it's just awesome to be able to match your training. Like you were talking about earlier, match your training to your nutrition. So it flows and you get the results faster. So that's what I do on the daily. And then I give tons of free information on, on yeah. Instagram coach share Garrison. And you know, we'll at some point, because I'm the thyroid expert, we can talk about how paleo and primal paleo thyroid solution. Yes. We'll, we'll do an episode there. Definitely. We'll probably do more on metabolic flexibility or autophagy or yeah. things we've learned about, um, injuries. So, you know, like Tara and I are planning on maybe once a month doing something health focused, you know, like, yeah, again, like, Hey, how do you, you have heavy metals? What to do now? You know, so we'll, right. we'll talk about this stuff, but cause as people can tell, <clears throat> we have hours, <laughs> we could, we could fill yes. hours. We, yes. I love talking about this and I know you do too. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, aside from, uh, Tara, her website, coach Tara Garrison and same name on Instagram, um, and while I'm a primal health coach, I focus more on like thyroid coaching and life coaching versus helping you really like Tara is the person to go to if you really need like a meal plan and you really need to like get right. in there and figure it out. Um, this has been awesome. I, I hope this inspires everybody to go take a look at their HbA1c and other things in their life because this is just going to improve every area. So again, MarksDailyApple.com, Primal Blueprint Podcast. If you even go back, we have 400 episodes now, something like that. But if you go back to the wow. first 10 or 15, it's Mark Sisson and Brad Kearns talking about the basic cool. principles. So this stuff's awesome. all free, people. It's all free. Yeah. Or you know what? Just Google Mark Sisson yeah. interview on YouTube and look up Seriously. him talking about it. Like You'll get it after a while. If some of this stuff doesn't make sense and you're like hold on I want to learn more those are some resources yeah. for that and of course there's Drew Manning is an author on keto and um, you know Rob Wolf has the paleo solution uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of great books out there for people to dive into yeah. this. so I don't know any closing words I mean I think that's it hopefully that's helpful we, we were like bing 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 so hopefully you guys I mean go back and listen but if, if there's I would just say the closing thing is if you have certain health topics you really want to hear us get into let us know because we're gonna, we are going to do those once a month Absolutely. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone. We will, uh, we'll see you. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Al.